Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, first uh, Journal Club of uh, 2023. Um, uh, hopefully this will be, now that we had a, a break for January, this will be happening uh, every uh, uh, month on the second uh, Tuesday of the, of the, of the month. Uh, so we'll hopefully be back together in, in four weeks. But today it's uh, uh, SACIP's turn, and in particular, we'll see the list of uh, people there, but I believe that the main, uh, the first presenter will be Simon uh, Driscoll from uh, Reading, who will be uh, talking about a couple of papers and the particular uh, connection, um, motivation being using machine learning uh, to parameterize uh, convection in, uh, in climate models. So as people keep uh, coming in, uh, it's just past, uh, uh, three minutes past the hour in whatever time zone we happen to be in. Uh, and so uh, over to you, uh, uh, Simon, and uh, thank you very much for doing this. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, so the, this is the uh, Verge Journal Club, and we thought we would, um, the aim obviously is to start with uh papers um that are very very relevant or seminal so uh, for each people of various surgery and climate teams to discuss a seminal paper has had a major influence on their research um and for uh research um, more broadly um so in order to uh understand this i thought it made sense to describe what the SESI project is so you can understand how if you don't know don't have familiarity with it yet you can uh understand why these be relevant um, and this uh, the SESI project is the, the Scale Aware CI project, and that uh, aims to develop a truly innovative Scale Aware continuum CI model for climate research. Um, it has five work packages, um, and it covers CI's code development, optimization, uh, rheology, isotope interaction, state assimilation, machine learning, and climate feedback as part of its aims. And I am in work package four, along with Alberto, uh, Julien, and, and many other people. And we're basically using novel data assimilation methods and machine learning methods and, and often hybrid uh, methods um, for unique physical and computational features of the ne this next version of Nexum. In particular, there's a, a big focus on unresolved and subgrid scale um, phenomena. And we're working on, uh, us, us personally, are working on the uh, parameterizations for ponds. There's a link for um, Ceci, if anyone else is more um, interested in. So this talk focuses on two studies introducing machine learning techniques, um, such as uh, neural networks and random forests, and showing how they can replace subgrid scale parameterizations in similar problems. So we know that they've not been, um, the, the papers aren't specifically about CIs, however, they are effectively showing that we can translate the skill set from uh, these different papers um, and make them relevant to us. Um, I am assuming that most people have uh, an awareness of uh, parameterization and so on, um, but just in case, um, so numerical uh, uh, atmospheric and coupled ocean, uh, atmospheric oceanic and land models, or GCMs used for um, uh, climate and weather predictions are based on solving 3D uh, time dependent 3D geophysical fluid dynamics equations on the sphere. There's the kind of schematic there on the right hand side of what you may expect from a climate model where you're going to have multiple vertical layers and maybe many uh, uh, horizontal uh, grid points. Um, and effectively, the, you'll be uh, breaking down these equations. Um, uh, how Vladimir Kostopolsky kind of starts to frame the problem is that we have the governing equations um, that can be based on conservation laws, and they'll be written symbolically. As you can see, where psi is a 3D uh, prognostic of dependent variables, so you're talking something about temperature, wind pressure that you know what to know about. D then is model dynamics, um, so it could be like a 3D partial uh, differential um, set, set of 3D partial differential equations for motion. Um, X is usually the, um, is, is an independent variable, so that could be you know, latitude, longitude, height, or anything uh, else. And then P is model physics and chemistry, so that could be long wave, short wave radiation, could be convection processes, or many other things. And you can see some of these uh, physical processes and we've also included in here, um, one of which is uh, CS. So while scientific problems uh, using these models can be extraordinarily complex, we note that they enjoy drastic sim simplifications, and in part that is due to uh, how computationally expensive um, it would be to, well, in fact, it is, um, to do things on such a fine resolution. Um, but then you have to basically um, start to parameterize these things at a subgrid scale. So you will have on the right hand side, if you remember the 
kind of a symbolic equation um, before you're going to start to parameterize um, a lot of these um, kind of model physics, model chemistry processes, which could be, you know, convection or, or uh, melt ponds or anything that you want. Um, where X is an effect consisting of atmospheric parameters, for example, uh, in the case of uh, convection, uh, describing the state of the atmosphere at a particular time and location, um, and Y is a vector of parameters providing an effective feedback to the atmosphere from the physical process described by the parameterization um, at, the, at the same location. So uh, after these simplifications, what we've noticed is basically we'll boil down what's going on in the model physics and model chemistry, and the parameterization itself will be uh, a, a very a simple version of these processes. Uh, and it will be basically uh, independent of time and location explicitly. So it'll, um, whatever process you're having doesn't, it will just be kind of uh, you know, a generic representation of that process. So motivated by that was the, um, how, how do we uh, kind of improve upon these parameterizations with a study by Vladimir Krasnopolsky and uh, authors, which is entitled um, Using Ensemble of Neural Networks to Learn Stochastic Convection Parameterizations for clim Climate and Numerical Weather Prediction Models from Data Simulated by a Cloud Resolving Model. So the ultimate motivations, if we can kind of boil down the, him, his reasoning, are climate models continue to have large uncertainties. Um, these, model, these uncertainties are primarily caused by the parameterization of subgrid scale processes that we've seen before. Um, and these based on heuristic assumptions create significant simplifications uh, and they do not vary in space and time. Short term high resolution simulations are now possible. Um, so he asks the question, is it possible to actually learn a parameterization directly from high, high resolution data um, to create a stochastic parameterization, um, which then will require an ensemble of neural networks um, and ultimately, then the ideal uh, scenario is that you have uh, a neural network based convection parameterization that can dem demonstrate a meaningful tem temporal and spatial um, generalization capability. And ultimately, you, you have, you know, more realistic uh, parameterization, as well as one of the things that uh, Vladimir Kostopolsky asks is that often these parameterizations are very kind of uh, computationally expensive. So can the neural network emulators also be uh, faster as well? So he starts off his um, a big question about whether you use observations or models for trade-off. Um, this so far for the most part, the his, well, his work and a lot of the works following are effectively using um, model data. So if you want to Learn, learn and parameterization, you effectively have to have a lot of faith in the model that you're using. And what you're doing is you're taking something that's very, very high resolution. You'll take a model that can represent processes explicitly in the physics, and you sort of trust that as being the you know absolute uh, truth as such. And then you learn, uh, train your neural networks on that. Another point is then whether you could use observations. However, as uh, Vermeer notes that there are observations often sparse and noisy, or it can be the case that certain variables that you you may have you know very good coverage of um, some variables, but maybe not all of the ones that you want. So you may have a model to kind of fill in the gaps where you'll force a model um, uh, in part with observations and then get it to reconstruct some other fields that you'll need. Um, I know that Julian Alberto and a few Mark and, and so on have been uh, pioneering some techniques on merging data simulation and machine learning to effectively see if we can break through uh, that barrier of using observations. Uh, but that was, uh, that these papers have been written only a couple of years ago, whereas Lamy was doing this back in 2013. So for what he chose, he chose a cloud resolving model, um, which would force using a Toga core uh, data. And the Toga core data um, is effectively this area in uh, kind of lightish blue. Um, here, it was a uh, sort of field observation um, campaign that was conducted between November 92 to February 93. Um, and there is uh, observations that are, have a horizontal resolution of about one kilometer, and there are about 96 vertical layers to 30 kilometers um, uh, in, the, in the Toga core data set. So it's effectively a very, very kind of fine resolution um, set of observations of uh, a, a small part of the uh, Pacific Ocean. And Vladimir then asked the question, if you can take this model, uh, take these observations, sorry, and use those to force uh, a cloud resolving model. So we have on the right-hand schematic here, we have the total data is the initial forcing, uh, initialization, sorry, and forcing. 
and that forces a cloud resolving model uh, by about one kilometer by one kilometer. Um, and once you've simulated that uh, data, then uh, he, he reduces that resolution to a, a level that's meaningful um, for his uh, train uh, data. Um, what you then have is a set of you know, pseudo observations because they'll be very, they may match uh, Togo data very, uh, very closely. However, he's also generating certain fields that are not uh, represented in the um, Togo observations to use as part of the training data set as well. Following then um, taking this training uh, data, he starts to create um, a neural network parameterization. So effectively, we're he, he, he's sort of he's, he's using a cloud resolving model, but it's still kind of forced by um, quite a lot of data. Um, uh, but the, 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 the general question of observations versus models, he sort of started, started with uh, using fine resolution models right now. Um, there, it, it, so this is the first paper, I think, that me, Julian, et cetera, of discussion of uh, stochastic parameterizations in uh, uh, you know representing parameterization stochastically for uh, with neural networks obviously Lord Dan has done um, work on that and a few other people more recently um, but it seems that uh, Vladimir Kutso raises the topic he does this a bit in his paper um, and then it's sort of the, the idea goes away a bit um, with some later papers but effectively he's also trying to go can we have a stochastic parameterization um, um, stochastic parameterization um, uh, as well. So maybe I should check the chat to see if anyone's not sure what that means. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, um, so basically, then he's gone. I've got a set of pseudo observations, and I want to train my model. Um, I want to train my neural, neural networks. Um, in order to represent a stochastic parameterization, he's um, basically um, uh, decided you need an ensemble neural networks. And uh, I assume that everybody knows about overfitting, but in case we, we don't, I'll just explain that briefly. So uh, overfitting is a problem in uh, machine learning where basically you can create any, you can have a very, very large layered model, um, maybe many hidden layers and so on and so forth, and you'll uh, model will literally fit the data, um, you know, perfectly. However, it'll be overfitting because when you then translate it to your test data, it will have also fit noise as well as, you know, the kind of uh, laws of physics they're trying to fit. So here he starts off with um, like one, um, there's one, two, three, four, five, um, hidden layers. Um, and he tests basically the more on the, uh, you can think of the, the bottom axis is the more complex you're making the model. Um, what's the error? And so this is the training error is in blue and the test error is in red. And um, again, so the, the, the training data set will be a data set that you let your model learn from, but you don't want it to learn noise as well. So you basically keep part of your uh, data set uh, aside and then you test on that and you go, can you, how, how well do you perform on data that you've not seen? Are you just learning um, to fit noise or if you learn the actual fundamental laws? And what you can see is you may expect is that as you increase model complexity in blue, the fit gets, the errors get lower and lower um, in, for both um, precipitation and then Q and C, which is the uh, apparent heat source in, in the cloud uh, convection. And um, uh, what you also expect then is that more is sort of kind of a optimal area for both these graphs where the training error will, will reduce, but the test error doesn't increase. Because if you're fitting more and more and more uh, well, but you're actually just fitting noise, you're going to see the, the training error is going to decrease and the test error is going to increase. So he sets up, um, he's got four main um, uh, targets and, and, and he chooses on a neural network that is about five hidden layers. And then he trains this, um, an ensemble of neural networks around um, uh, using that, this, um, using this Togo core data set that we described before. Um, he has four main targets, which is the, uh, uh, named the Q and C, um, which is the profile of apparent heat source, Q2 profile, apparent moisture, moisture sink, um, pure EC, which is the precipitation rates, which is a scalar, and cloud, which is a profile of cloudiness, or it's actually cloud fraction. Um, 
as an example then on the uh, kind of left and bottom um uh the um one of these lines in here is the toga core um data set and then i think the solid line with the cross going through it i think that's the mean um it's slightly hard to see but i think that's the mean of the ensembles of the um, neural networks that he's trained um you can see this very kind of similar situation for precipitation that there's the, the broad agreement between both the toga core observations and his ensemble of neural networks um so effectively he's saying okay so we've 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 gone from our you know uh pseudo observations data set and can we train and learn uh, this relation between these kind of inputs and the uh, what what the cloud resolving model will predict, and he concludes, we, we you know we can do that uh, offline kind of section. Um, the next question then is gone. So we've learned this parameterization. Can we they replace parameterize? Uh, can they replace the actual physical parameterization online um, and over a much wider Pacific region? Um, because he's now running uh, kind of a GCM, so he's putting this back into. Um, this parameterization, taking out the parameterization and putting in the neural networks in the GCM that it is uh, running. And obviously that has a larger grid scale. So it's over a much wider Pacific region. Um, and he also runs it for 11 years as opposed to the February, um, November 2092 to uh, February 93 that he uh, trained it on. So it's also a test of kind of, you know, some test of uh, generalization capability as well. Um, the long story short of this is that effectively look on again on the right, so that's a, uh, three different mean cloud profiles for the total uh, period. I'm pretty certain that's not Kelvin a day, that's meant to be cloud fraction. Um, I've looked at a few times since it's <laughs> cloud fraction there. Um, so I think that's a typo. Um, but basically you can see that there's, uh, you have the Toga core data set, you have the uh, CAM neural network, which is the uh, GCM with a neural network replacing the um uh, replacing the parameterization um and the um uh cam solid which is just the standard model so that, sorry and the pseudo observations and you have dash lines thick line and the solid line and they're all in pretty good agreement um he's also uh, kind of gone through there's more in the paper but basically you look at a lot of the kind of uh results and statistics and it seems to suggest that Long story short, you can start to use neural networks to replace um, these parameterizations. So that maybe, hopefully it's not a bit too fast. This is one, uh, one of the papers. Um, and a summary of this paper is that neural networks can learn a parameterization. They can replace the parameterization online, um, i.e. they will run, you can get neural networks to learn the physical relations and put them back into the model. And you're gonna uh, get, a, get a climate model that's actually running uh, pretty well. Um, because he's used it for um, a slightly longer period and a slightly, um, it's also fairly similar uh, climatically uh, period, um, but it's not identical. There is some suggestion that there's uh, more generalization ability as well. Um, so, uh, you know, the ability to adapt to a change in data environment, although it's not very, very uh, it's not radically different. Um, but nonetheless, he, it was a very kind of prospective study um, and pretty broad brushstroke. Um, and he came away with the conclusion that, you know, maybe we're, we're onto something here. So he suggests that further work would be to generate the ideal kind of case in Vladimir's mind was to generate a more representative cloud resolving model uh, training data set. So in theory, could you have uh, almost worldwide kind of observations and similar nature to the Togo core experiment? Um, and then you could basically force a kind of, you know, global um, uh, cloud resolving model um, to build a parameterization. Um, then the next, you know, once you've got that data, you're going to train and test the global neural network convection parameterization. And uh, he also talks about introducing tools to allow neural networks to adapt to changes in environment. Um, so the one one of the suggestions he says the approach uses various procedures to recognize new atmospheric states emerge due to the changes in the environment. Um, uh, other other approaches that we'll discuss later also involve things like um, basically scaling the input and output variables, um, which is called you know a climate invariant um, generalization. But effectively, he's got to the point where uh, he's he's shown that we can start to use neural networks at some prospective level um, to learn and replace. 
uh, parameterizations. <clears throat> Um, so will will the neural network uh, have stability issues um, when run uh, the online is, uh, test for a longer period? So the sorry. So the um, uh, ensembles here are for about ten years um, that he's run for, and so these are the mean profiles of a ten years, and that's uh, a time series of perform that's not probably live. Um, so he's actually, they are, it's an ensemble of, of neural networks and they run for about 10 years. So there's, it seems to be fairly stable, um, which seems to be pretty impressive, especially, you know, given them kind of models are uh, very, very complex. Um, so yeah, so it, it not that, that is a big problem for neural networks sometimes, uh, when they're putting uh, models, but it, in Crescent Polsky study, it wasn't. Um, next we're going to... Oh, Simon, could I, could I just yeah, yeah. Uh, stop you just for a moment? That, that seems a, that was great that there was a question at that stage. And I just wonder, has, has anybody else got a question on paper one, uh, so to speak, just before you move on to paper two, just to give people an opportunity to ask or, or comment something right at this stage, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. Of course, I may, I may be wrong. <laughs> oh, no, Pedram. Uh, there we are. Thank you, Pedram. Hey, uh, thanks, Simon. So I have a question about like generating ensemble by basically changing the initial condition of the weights. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. the fact that you get some sort of ensemble, does it mean that you get to different local minima? Because yeah. if you go to the same local minima minimum, then you should get basically the same weights. Yeah. Uh, and generally, is this like a? I, I have seen other people doing this. Is it like a meaningful way of generating an ensemble? Because the other option is dropout, where you actually, you know, turn off the weights and generate yeah. an ensemble. But anyway, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about about this. Yeah, so I can, I can see uh, Julian nodding as well, and we, we've discussed it before um, that um, the use um, of stochastic is slightly um, maybe not perfectly accurate, um, as well as the use of um, just basically, uh, it doesn't seem to be the, uh, an ideal way, as you say, for generating um, uh, a, a truly stochastic parameterization. It seems a sort of, uh, some sort of token hint at, at this is, has some level of noise in it. Um, and there are definitely um, much better ways that could be done to that, yeah. Um, I think Dominic has a question then. Yeah, Dominic, yeah, th th thank you. Dominic? Uh, it was a question about the computational performance. Uh, I yeah. think you, you said that it was, um, if you go back a slide, you mentioned they uh, reported that it was, PAM with the neural network is is very yeah. fast to run. Oh, sorry, the neural network in it is very fast to run. Yeah. Uh, w were they able to quantify that overall the, the CAM NN approach was faster than the normal CAM parameterization? Yeah, so he says that the... Uh, neural network is three times faster, and I'm assuming that that's just the neural network as opposed to the parameterization, parameterization as opposed to the whole model. Um, but yeah, so it, it seems that he's basically try, uh, actually uh, tested that himself, and he says about three times faster. Okay, great, thank you. Tobias? Yeah, just just as follow up to to the to the ensemble question. Um, I mean, I mean, so. So there's a there's a whole technique about about initializing, let's say, ten different ensembles and 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 and, and training these and training these ensemble, uh, these these ten different neural networks independently, and then and then landing landing in in in, in local minima. It's 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 called deep ensemble, and and actually it is. I mean. In some sense, it is a pretty pretty good approximation to to to. Or it it gives in uh, empirically a better approximation to the to the uncertainty than using, for example, dropout. Um, mm -hmm. And and yeah, I mean it is it is it is it is actually done it is done a lot in in in, in machine learning nowadays. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it it, it would be really. Um... What whilst uh, Flamia is basically hinting at stochastic, there is definitely um, 
uh, it's not exactly the ideal stochastic representation, and it's called there's alternate other forms um, for that as well. Um, so, uh, in 2021, also used for random initialization, but they select it on some members like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then there's also the other option of uh, dropout, of course. So, um, Okay, thanks for that, Simon. So, so I think that was a great little interlude and uh, <laughs> uh, questions. And so, uh, crack on. Cool, thank you. Um, so then, basically, in paper two um, is the next paper of Ogorman uh, et al. in twenty eighteen. So they said um, in in a pioneering study, cross up pulse here, I'll use an ensemble of shallow artificial neural networks um, to learn temperature and moisture tendencies from a cloud res resolving model simulations. Forced by observations from a region of the Pacific, equatorial Pacific. Um, and then they go on to say that here we use idealized tests to explore the potential of, of machine learning uh, based parameterizations for simulation of climate and, um, uh, and climate change. We demonstrate ways in which the machine learning parameterization can be used to gain physical insight into the interaction of convection um, with its environment. Um, so this came out, uh, see on the right hand side, uh, on 2018. And ultimately, the differences um, between the Crescent Policy Study and the Gorman Study is, uh, or I argue the main differences are, um, for one, Crescent Policy uses neural networks, and Gorman uses random forests. And we're basically saying that you know there are multiple ways to uh, uh, emulate the uh, you know convection uh, parameterizations. Um, Krasnopolsky is stochastic, although we've gone through the um, slightly. Uh, Slightly maybe hand wavy uh, way that stochastic is, is treated in the paper. Uh, or Gorman, they they effectively just go for a deterministic um, uh, uh, emulator, um, and they know that. With Krasnopolsky, there's no mention or consideration of conserving um, conservation of physical laws. Um, while still Gorman, um, they actually very um, in their their random forest, uh, they can guarantee that there's going to be conservation of energy. Um, uh, when they they actually know also so they tried neural networks a little bit and they know that they couldn't um, conserve energy and they um, switch them for the random forests. With Krasnoy policy, there's no focus on extremes. There's no focus on anything really uh, exotic or, or the properties of climate apart from can it get some you know mean fields and is it dr uh, drifting or unstable. Um, whereas Goldman start to ask you know we this uh, approach is showing some promise now. Can we basically get it to shift um, uh, get it to um, you know, move it to, uh, to to apply it to uh, other parts of a uh, climate phenomena. Um, there's more. Um, uh, there's trust the policy is basically is uh, looking at verification, and that's roughly around the existing climate. He does test the model on uh, online on some level, um, some um, a climate that's not exactly the same as, you know, there's a training and a test set and so on and so forth, but it's not actually specifically, you know, majorly different, whereas the government actually try and focus in on whether, they, you know, you can use uh, emulators to predict uh, things like climate change and so on and so forth. So uh, to generate data, they use a relatively complex in their uh, terminology convection scheme. Um, and this is model simulations again. So they basically go through mentioning some um, observational um, uh, uh, data, but very quickly just go for uh, model simulations. And this time they use the relaxed Arakawa, Arakawa Schubert convection scheme. Um, and the, but the base of the scheme is an ensemble of entraining plumes that represent both deep and shallow convection. Um, on the right hand side, we can see we've got uh, random forests for those of you who don't know. Um, so there are decision trees. Um, uh, random forest is basically a mul multiple decision tree um algorithm um uh you know so decision trees basically you 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 you, you take a day and you split it up into two um things each time so you could have you know like a snooker ball or something it'd be you know uh, red balls and yellow balls and, and it'll ask this question it'll go which is the way that i can split these two uh you know my data right now um in the most meaningful way and it'll just keep on iterating uh, through that for the number of layers the you uh, leaves and nodes that you have and the more leaves and nodes the more um specific you can get again you'll have a problem of overfitting um and basically the part of reducing um uh fitting to noise and so on is is uh by using random forest which is multiple versions of these decision trees 
Um, so for training data, they take a, it's a GCM, but it's, it's, it's a kind of stripped back GCM. So it's, it's more simple than a regular uh, GCM with all the uh, physical processes in. Um, and they spin the model up with that convection scheme. Um, and so it's basically like, a uh, again, a cloud resolving model um, over 700 days from uh, iso isothermal rustic um, in order to reach uh, an equilibrium. Um, they then take a subsequent 3,300 days used for training, um, and they train random forests. So it's actually, it's only trained on um, th 3D fields of temperature and sp specific humidity profiles, um, but they generally deem that enough. And then they basically, once they've trained their random forests, they start to go, can how well are these random forests are uh, able to predict um, the same kind of, you know, uh, phenomena that are relaxed our car shoot but model is um, predicting. So on the bottom, you can see the uh, RIS convection. Yeah. This, yeah. Uh, um, this is the precipitation rate um, that the relaxed our car um, scheme predicts. And then on the left hand side, you have the random forest prediction. Um, also, just check the chat. Uh, it's just so yeah i think i've muted accidental mics please <laughs> um so basically this is now their you know they, you can see their random forest predictions are very similar to their um convection scheme predictions so ultimately again uh long story short they can show that random forests can learn um uh the kind of given the input to uh, a cloud resolving um model kind of scheme can it predict the output and the answer is yes um, the trained random forest is then put into the um, a GFTL GCM. Um, sorry, so is this study that runs a few times faster? Oh, Krasnopolsky's one does run times, uh, a few times faster. I can't remember how many times it says, so the Romans will be three times. Um, um, I, I can't, so I can't remember the exact number that Krasnopolsky will have. Um, basically, they've, they've trained their random forest scheme now. Um, and they'll say uh, they, they they look at then you know, on the right hand side we'll have things like tropical equivalent potential temperature, eddy kinetic energy, mean precipitation, so on and so forth. All these are kind of normal um, fields, and then they also test uh, um, it on extreme precipitation. So in the blue you have the GFDA mo GFDL uh, model that it has no convection scheme in whatsoever. And then the dashed uh, red line is one which has the random forests uh, that have been trained. And the uh, uh, black line is the one which has the um, cloud resolving um, model, the original uh, RS um, perfection model. Um, and you can see that there's both close agreement between those two. So it's suggesting that the random forests have indeed learned the um, uh, uh, you know, properties and, and, and the relationships in the uh, uh, in, 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 in that cloud resolving model. What they notice is that um, it's, it's interesting to them is that extreme precipitation, so client, um, machine learning has some uh, potential issues with uh, trying to capture extremes. And they, they notice that extreme precipitation, for example, is actually captured very well um, with random forests. And they know that that's even when they've not tried to train um, the model specifically on extremes in any kind of way. I don't quite, um, I, I don't think they, they explore completely the reasons why I can't, don't think they do. Um, but it, basically they're, they're, they're noting that they're um, able to simulate not only um, online, they're able to simulate not only the kind of the general properties of the climate, but also kind of, you know, slightly more exotic um, uh, statistics such as the extremes and variances and so on. Um, they then asked the question, can they, um, can they emulate basically a, a changing climate? And um, somehow I have a changing climate. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> the changing climate should be this slide. Um, apologies about that. So they then note that the, can um, their model train it on a changing climate? And so the basically thing that they say is they, they, they in order to represent climate change, they up the CO2 level um, that in, well, the, the, they alter the radiation uh, scheme. So it's effectively like um, upping the CO2. And they, um, you know, I know that Krasnopolsky has uh, basically said it's important to see if, if the model can simulate changes in environments and not just the environment that you've trained it on. 
Um, and ultimately, they know that the model does not capture well changes in a warmer climate if it's trained in a colder climate. So you can see, for example, um, that uh, the random forests, if you give random forests training data from your cloud convection scheme, and you provide it with um, uh, both, uh, so you, you, you have, um, you run your standard model and you go, uh, this is a controlled climate, and then you run it again, you go, this is a hot climate, and you give both of that data for the random forest to learn, then random forest will actually be very good at reproducing that um, warmer climate. Um, if you climb it on each climate separately or combined, or if you train it on the warm climate, um, it's going to be able to capture um, uh, these, these differences. That's true. However, if you train it on a control climate, so a colder one, and you ask it, can you now uh, predict the, the, the changes in convection to a warmer climate? It doesn't do that at all. And I think that's one major important uh, thing is that there's also the issue, whilst these papers are some of the first papers, you know, the first papers to uh, effectively consider using uh, neural networks to um, replace these parameterizations. We also know that it, it's probably a pretty serious <laughs> critique um, that they are incapable of, um, well, potentially incapable of representing um, uh, warm climates all the time. Sometimes they, they seem to, or they'll capture extremes that you think that they weren't trained on, but they may actually be unable to uh, answer, you know, uh, questions of climate um, that's not been seen. Um, so the conclusions are that the um, random for forest parameterization leads to robust and accurate simulations of the control climate, and the decision tree uh, based allows the conservation of energy. Um, random forest parameterization also can capture extreme events. Um, however, adapt, so you can basically have energy conservation, you can capture extremes, you can get the general um, uh, you know properties of the climate that you trained on. However, if you start to change and go, hey, let's 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 see if you how well you're going to start to predict clouds in um, a warm climate. It, it they know that that's a very big challenge. So um, further work that they've they've noted is whether machine learning parameterization should be non-local in space and time. It's a bit um, similar to what Vladimir Krasnikov said. Um, whether it should be applied in addition to uh, like an emulator should be applied in addition to boundary layer radiation large scale cloud schemes or whether you just have something that's capable of replacing all of these. Um, I think that that's, I mean, I think it's Christine Lessig um, and some other people in uh, Magdeburg, I think have been sort of uh, pushing the angle that maybe machine learning models can replace the, the, the whole thing. Um, or there's a discussion then whether you just run with a hybrid model. Um, they noted that if they extend their study to a more realistic uh, uh, global circulation model, for example, which has land and topography, um, then it will have the problems of needing to uh, predict convections at, at different elevations, the presence of topography. So again, it's a still a fairly idealized um, study. Um, um, maybe we should, if there's, there's a bit of a kind of like recap and summary at the end, so maybe I'll go on. Um, so just how these are useful to SASI. So um, what we've been able to do and take the, these kind of ideas that they've done um, is for us, because we're building the CS, um, uh, Nexium CS model, uh, we're applying it to melt ponds. So on the top right, you can see the melt ponds are complex subgrid scale uh, phenomena requiring parameterizations. And we've uh, basically trained neural networks uh, to see if they can learn this, this parameterization. So we're sort of walking in the same footsteps of these uh, earlier studies. Um, on the right-hand side, there's both linear regressions, which are LR and neural networks. And these are the errors of both linear regressions and neural networks relative to the actual parameterization scheme. And what we're able to show is that the neural networks are doing a very good job of um, simulating the uh, parameterization. Linear regressions, however, become very, um, just the, the errors grow very, very rapidly, very, very quickly. And they sort of settle into this um, other climate. That doesn't actually cause the model to blow up because they just cause an enormous amount of Melt uh, melt ponds, but they all have covered. Uh, uh, they all have ice, lids covered in ice. <laughs> um, so effectively, it's just like a large amount of ice in a way. Um, uh, basically, we're showing that neural networks can run stably. And the question now is whether we can use such use observations. Um, and this is the hopefully then we can just start have maybe a bit of a discussion after this because 
um, for as a summary, the parameterizations cause substantial uncertainty in client modeling. Um, machine learning has been shown to learn replaced parameterizations. Um, to date, most of the work is learned around high resolution simulations, and we can just generally capture, you know, uh, broad properties. Um, but a few major challenges that um, and discussion points, perhaps. Um, so, how do we incorporate? observations to train on um uh, so we don't you know we don't have any assumptions on models we don't have just cloud resolving models that are very fine resolution but they'll also have some you know parameter values in them um so there's conversation pseudo observations or um observations can we build um emulators that are successful in a climate different to that which they are trained in um and then also the question of stochastic versus deterministic emulators because again it's been raised by krasnopolsky but as lots of people here have noted, um, whilst it was also dropped a little bit later, that even Preston Polsky's tr treatment of stochastic um, parameterizations has been pretty um, uh, dissatisfactory. So maybe the ideal um, kind of parameterization that we'd be facing um, is something that would be stochastic. Um, we can see that Lausanne um, has done work on this. It would have ob be observationally driven, so you have no assumptions whatsoever. You have just pure kind of data. Um, uh, driven model, uh, Julian, uh, Alberto, Mark, Lauren, and um, has been kind of working on combining data assimilation techniques and machine learning to infer and resolve scale parameterizations. Um, so there's also the question then of climate invariant. You'd maybe want a, a model that is, is both stochastic, it's observationally trained, and it is also capable of dealing with warmer climates. So Tom Buclair, they take, um, they basically they scale um, the input snappers of the models. Um, so there's a kind of invariant um, uh, inputs to models, which seems to give a lot better um, uh, performance over different climates um, that they've not previously seen. And then physically informed, uh, constrained or informed neural networks, there's physically informed machine learning uh, case studies for weather and climate model, as an article by uh, Kashanath and others, and other things. But maybe there are other suggestions other people have, um, but it seems that these could be if you if you have a stochastic observationally driven model that is able to predict in future climates um, and conserves energy and so forth that, that seems to be um, very much onto a win. Um, so that is effectively the presentation, the, the papers that sort of suggested and paved the way for people to start using these techniques. Um, and hopefully then there's a bit of uh, understanding how we've used them and uh, hopefully this will lead to some discussion afterwards for where and why we, they can be useful. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Simon. So um, before I open out the floor, th there was a possibility that other SACIT member teams might want to say something. Did I misunderstand the communication or is it, it was all, you were the main spokesperson? Or did somebody else from SACIT want to say something at this stage, or should I just ask questions? SACIT people? Well, I mean, it's, I think uh, Simon has said, uh, uh, it's Alberto here, Alberto Carassi. I think Simon said already quite well how, while we consider these to be relevant papers. Probably one of the points that uh, I would like to highlight more is that uh, besides the application, the, the way the approach we'll be using is pretty much the same. We are also proceeding there. We are, we are working through this process of first uh, trying to learn a sort of perfect uh, model or perfect data assumption. So we are actually the result that uh, Simon gave as a snapshot in the previous slides was obtained by, again, similar to this paper, by, by, by training our uh, machine learning model against uh, the output of the parameterization we intend to replace. So as far as this is concerned, it's not really about improving it in terms of the script, description of the reality. That challenge will come later. And of course, answering that, answering that question poses a number of problems. And this paper that I'm mentioning these slides here offers some venue. And this is where we are at the moment. So we are now at the moment of moving uh, uh, to the use of real data in specific for the problem that this is more not just for SACIP in general, more specific for what Simon is doing, but I, it applies to all of the other things that are happening in SACIP, also in the Paris group with Mark Bocquet and Tobias, Aban Farsh, etc. It's really which type of data we are at disposal and whether these data are enough. Uh, how they are mm, related to what we really want to uh, emulate, etc. And in, in the case of melt ponds, it is not that trivial because we don't really have enough data of these uh, objects. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alberto, for that uh, further gloss. So, um, does anybody have any questions? Comments? I certainly do, which is uh, um, that the issue um, effectively what I would describe as using synthetic data. You're using model yeah. data to do your yeah. training. Yeah. And it, it, I don't want to say you swept it under the carpet, but it seems way harder yeah. to then use uh, observational data, right? Because yeah. the observational data is noisy. Mm -hmm. and, and you kind of have what you can measure right you know you yeah. know it's not the, 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 it's not you presented it there's an issue that with model data in that you, you know you, it's only as good as the underlying model but the kind of mathematician in me says but you know everything that's in your model you have access to all the the data and it's completely yeah it's just the numbers man right you know it's just the data whereas if you're actually using observational information you've got instrument error you've got mm -hmm. um, yeah variability that you can't control known unknowns unknown unknowns yeah. And, yeah. and you've also got the phenomenon which i experienced with sort of oceanography data that you, you can only you measure what you measure right you, you know and then you have to make further assumptions about the measurements which being related to the quantities you're actually interested in like you know you you, you measure the one component's the velocity gradient and you assume that's telling you the dissipation which is what you want right so i mean i, I discussed is it surely that's the same issue with uh, observational data in ice um, yeah yeah um i know it's alberto just turned his camera on i don't know if he wants to say anything um as well as julian um but yeah i basically agree um as you can see the there have been some uh efforts to start to combine um uh you know the uh observations because they're sparse and noisy um and again yeah um, I'm not sure if either Albert or Julian want to say anything um, on the, those challenges. Or <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know, but it's it's perfectly true. So there are pro and cons to to learn from observation and from model, of course. And uh, but the the idea, as Alberto stated, is that if you if you learn from an existing model, what you gain, which is a lot, is that you can reduce the cost of the computation of your parameterization scheme. That that's that's all you can uh, target, but that's that's a lot because that's that's a major problem. Uh, if you if you want to to improve your knowledge or improve, yeah, you can even learn something uh, on the parameterization scheme or improve the the accuracy of the parameterization scheme. Parameterization scheme, sorry. Then yes, you need to 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 put observation into the into the game, but that that's. Difficult because, as you say, you don't observe necessarily the quantities that you want to 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 parameterize, and of course, it's noisy, uh, incomplete. You don't have enough. So maybe in the atmosphere, there is it's it's a, there could be more observation. I don't know, uh, but uh, yeah, that's more challenging. But this is also necessary if you want to learn something from your ML parameterization. Otherwise, you you have some speed, which is already very nice. Great, thank you, Dominic. Uh, your your hand is up. Yeah, I had a um, more of a well, like a comment and like a, a sort of open question then around this particular issue. So, I was thinking about this uh, um, recently, and and um, this problem with trying to train uh, parameterizations based on observational data. And there's there's some uh, was some nice recent work uh, by um, Christopher Bretherton and, and and others. Where they were looking at correcting, doing this uh, sort of correcting style approach, correcting a coarse grained uh, model based on a, um, a trained high resolution model, and using that to you, know, you run things in coarse grain, but you have the the high resolution basically sort of weighting it and sort of correcting some of the errors that come from the course. And I sort of wondered whether anyone had tried to do the same thing for observational data and do. So sort of correcting when you have gaps or these kind of problems from calibration or you got holes in your data and things, whether you could do a sort of correcting approach based on um, some actual physics model that you had, um, of some high resolution physics model that you could use to sort of 
help you fill the gaps in a sensible way, essentially. And I'm it, the idea occurred to me, and I wondered whether someone had already done that or thought about that. Yeah, uh, Julian. <clears throat> oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I see there is a raising hand, but I have an, uh, maybe an answer to that. I, I think to some extent, why, what you are describing is uh, data assimilation. Data assimilation is a way to fill the gap between observing. Uh, yes, yes, that's what I was about to say. The same, indeed. So yeah, that's... but you don't, you don't seem to to agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I I see what you're saying, but um, but that 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 that's like the kind of the jewel, right? That's your forcing, um. You know, assimilation is like you're you're using observ observational to correct the model, right? You're sort of putting it in and, and adapting it. I'm thinking it's all, almost the other way around. Um, it's both. You can see both the way. You, okay. You 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 merge model and observation. So you you correct the observation by the, from model uh, constraint, or you correct the model by observational yeah. constraint. You can yeah. see it both way. Both okay. Way. All right, fair enough. So that's a well well understood set of techniques, really, as assimilation or imputation style things okay well i'll have to think a bit more of a think about that then. thank you uh, christian yeah on dominic's question um i think yeah i thought about uh, quite a bit about it and i talked to other people one way would maybe to pre-train for example on real analysis like i'm an atmospheric guy i think about era five to pre-train on era five and then fine-tune you know, observations because when you have essentially yeah, all the big structures where you don't have issue with gaps because essentially you always have some signal I and mean, then you can fine-tune and try to correct this and you get out the biases that the real analysis processes introduces using the observational data um as far as i know nobody has pulled this off but i think we are getting close to the point like in the atmosphere with graph casts forecast net so people have shown era five you really can train large networks based on it and i think that's the next frontier to uh, move to observations and see how you can correct these models based on observations yeah that, i bet you wanted to comment on, on that because well no okay if you want to comment on this go ahead and then i will Okay, yeah, yeah, because yeah, just f first, uh, ERA five is already uh, an observational based uh, data sets because it's it's uh, the result of uh, data simulation, just as we were uh, saying just before. And uh, but but the, the second thing is yes, I, I think that what you describe is kind of transfer learning when you when you learn model simulation when you have a lot of data and then you can fine tune your model on the limited amount of observation you have. And I think this is a very good um, very good idea, very good venue. And I think. It has already been tested, and uh, I think, um, for example, of a paper, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the author, but it was a Nature a paper on uh, ENSO predictions that were learned on uh, re, uh, on, on uh, reanalysis or simulation and that were fine-tuned on uh, observations, exactly as you described. So yeah, I think this is a, a, a good, good idea, good venue. Great, Julian. So uh, Alberto, please. But just to complete a bit, I, of course, because of the group of people I work with and I belong, uh, I also think that uh, overall the, the potential of using data simulation, even just as a tool to provide a better data set, which is then digestible for from the, from the machine learning step, is of course a claim that they will support very much. Now, obviously, working on an idealistic setup like the one of the work we did with Mark and Julien and Laurent, which is mentioned in there, moving that to the case we are dealing now with with the, with Simon, I know that it's a, it's a big it's a big jump. Uh, but I think that is an important venue, which is very potent, has a strong potential. But there is also one point that I would like to stress: uh, even if we stay just in the realm of this uh, perfect model or perfect data uh, setup that. Uh, uh, that Simon has explored so far and the true paper he has been discussing we're using, uh, there is also, in, even, even in that same context, uh, the, the fact that we have two steps, what we call offline and online training, it already uh, presents it's a completely different type of problems, but it's already presented interesting challenge on the problem of understanding that physical process. Because uh, well, by offline here, we meant, for instance, in the case of what Simon was presenting, learning the mapping from input and output of the subroutine, which is the physical based parameterization of the response we are trying to, sub to substitute. And that is really is a really sort of easier, easier task. But when you then plug in that into the full CIS model, whereby that uh, physical parameterization we are now substituting with a machine learning based parameterization is inserted, which is called online, 
then a number of other problems arises, including stability and so on and so forth. So I really just to say that I think that uh, with the high of the real data that we are also moving to, even if we stay in that real, there is a lot that we learn on the capability of the machine learning algorithm is on the specific architecture. And also I would say on the challenge of appending a physical constraint, if any, because those are you know, the ones that may be easily be rejected when we then plug the parameterization online. Great, thank you, uh, Albert. That's great. And I think the last question, Pedran. Uh, yes, yeah, I, I raised my hand before Julian mentioned transfer learning, but that's what I would say. I think transfer learning is really a great way to, to basically incorporate observational data when they are very noisy and sparse. I, I think each problem would be different, but in our database project, we have balloon data that at best we can get a spectrum from, uh, from that data. But uh, we are going to try to use transfer learning to basically incorporate some of that into our model uh, based data and the transfer learning works really well. Uh, so it's, a, it's another way to think about sort of doing data assimilation for, for this kind of problem. Great. And, and on that uh, optimistic and uh, consensus <laughs> building uh, point, I think uh, we should draw this uh, to a close and thank you to the um, face it team and Simon uh, in particular for a really uh, interesting and uh, well presented and thought provoking uh, uh, journal club that's exactly what i've been hoping for so thanks a lot simon thanks a lot guys and gals and uh, hopefully see you again in four weeks so cool. thank you very much everyone Great bye job. bye thank you simon bye bye thank you simon bye 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 bye, bye, -bye. thanks everyone cheers